I suffer from cystic fibrosis. It's a disease that, among other things, makes breathing difficult. I was first diagnosed with it as a child after the first of many late night emergency room visits. Living with CF means that while I have the potential to live a full and relatively decent life, it's nowhere near guaranteed. My parents were heartbroken when they got the news. Although they'd never told me themselves, I had learned that they had a hard time conceiving before I came along. They had tried every trick in the book, fertility drugs, dieting, specialist, clinical treatment, you name it, they tried it. Eight years with no luck, only to be delivered a sickly baby that wouldn't make it to 20. To say they did everything they could to keep me safe was an understatement. I was like a figure in a snow globe, caged in a bubble for my own protection. I know my parents loved me. They loved me so much it swallowed them up and ate them whole. Which is why I feel so guilty. Knowing that you're the root of every ounce of pain, every bit of worry and fear in your loved one's lives is a punishment I would never wish upon my worst enemy. I remember our first visit. I remember feeling the tears fall on my face as my father held me in his arms, frantically screaming at the nurse for help. Even now, I remember how fast his heart was beating against my cheek. We already knew. The pastoral draining technique was practically second nature to us, but it had never been this bad. My oxygen-deprived brain was struggling to keep up as those hospital lights flooded my vision. I was swimming in a fluorescent ocean as the doctors worked to clear my mucus-coated airways. Through the sea of white and the incoherent speech that my brain was working overtime to try and decipher, I heard my parents' sobs as they stood in the hallway, too horrified to look at me. All the anesthesia in the world couldn't stop the hurt I felt in that moment. This, more or less, would become my routine. I was what they called a frequent flyer at the hospital. I knew the nurses on a first name basis. I even had dinner with some who had come to visit and check in while I was first staying there. I come to befriend the people who shared rooms with me. But as one after another grew weaker, I learned better. My life was split between pyjama-clad stretches at home and stints in a gown at the hospital. To say things were a bit dull at times wouldn't do it justice. Dreaming was my only escape. Sure, I had hobbies and things to do in the real world, but in the dream world, I was thrown into a new and exciting realities that I had absolute control over. Worlds where I didn't constantly have to be operated on. Living lives that truly made me feel free. I lived a life where my parents didn't have to worry, where they weren't sad anymore. In lucid dreaming, my life was saved. It was the sleep paralysis that killed me. I had my run-ins with REM sleep hallucinations, nightmares that lasted full nights and visions that haunted me. It wasn't so much the images that scared me, it was the lack of control as your body becomes lead and how slowly time moves as you suffer that silent eternity. The first time it happened, I cried when I woke up. I vowed to never do it again as long as I lived. For a while, I was successful. As the days grew duller, the stints grew longer, and my parents struggled to conceal their bottomless sadness, I gave in. I crawled into that bed and let the void swallow me whole just for a chance of escape. I wish, with every fiber of my being, I could have held out for just a little bit longer. Every day seemed to become a new challenge. Reoccurring lung infections seemed to become my new reality. News got worse, my lungs were fighting for every breath, and despite nightly attacks to my parents' hopelessness, no one could do a thing to help. As we went home that week, it was revealed to me that I would no longer have the privacy of my own room. Given the increasing severity of my attacks, my parents thought it best to sleep there with me in case the worst were to happen. I felt gutted. Now they couldn't enjoy a single night's sleep without my problems interfering and likely creeping into their dreams. As I saw them toss and turn, heard them talk in their sleep about their nightmares, nightmares in which I was all that seemed present, all-consuming, all-powerful. I felt like the biggest burden alive. As I drifted off in that slumber, 
I wished for it all to just end. I didn't want to wake up anymore. I had just finished my reality checks as I slipped into that fresh dream when I felt a familiar pull. In an instant, everything seemed to be fading away. The ground beneath me seemed to give way as my edges became fuzzy. I was waking up. As the world went dark, my eyes fluttered open and I was paralyzed once more. The room was dark. The only light that faded in seemed to be coming from the bathroom down the hall. I took a deep breath as I tried to steal myself for the monsters that always came. At least, I tried to. The mucus that coated the walls and passages of my lungs had blocked my airways. I was choking in my sleep. I looked frantically around my room for help. It was my mother's turn that night, and as my eyes fell on that empty sleeping roll, I realized I was alone. I quickly put two and two together and realized with a sinking stomach that she was the reason why the bathroom light was on. I was a prisoner of my mind, desperately trying to snap out of it so that I could call for help. I felt the veins of my eyes bulge as the lack of oxygen set in. The shadows crept in around me as the sounds of blood rushing in my ears was slowly coming to a halt. In that dimly lit room, as I lay dying, he came. From the darkness crept a tall, shadowy figure. He seemed to waltz into the room to the slowing beat of my heart. Although I could only see the rims of his eyes, I could see that twisted grin growing slowly clear as day. I could feel his sharp nails as he climbed onto my bed, slowly eclipsing my body as he did. Pain shot through everything he touched like static. His hand seemed to envelop me completely as his fingers gripped my flesh. What's the matter? He spoke, his voice sounding as if someone had torn their vocal cords in every way possible. Can't sleep. With that, he let out a laugh and shook the room. His laughter sounded like nails on a chalkboard, mixed with a deep guttural growl that seemed to compound an echo in every knock and cranny of the room. Giggling, he craned his head against my chest and listened with glee, quietly indulging himself on my heart's final beats. Once it had stopped completely, he snapped his head upwards to face me. His small, black beady eyes sat in impossible deep sockets. Uh-oh, he rasped. I think it's broken. He licked his lips as he leaned in towards me, inches from my face. Don't worry, I know exactly how to help. I felt his nails dig into my flesh as he hoisted me up and threw me over his shoulder, cackling as we ran into the darkness that engulfed us both. I felt his every step roughly collide as it hit the dirt. As he dashed, I felt myself slowly slipping from his hold as we moved further and further along. It hadn't been more than ten feet before I fell hard and fast onto the sharp black floor. He stopped, if only to comically mine an overzealous oops. I rolled in fearful sweat as I hit the dirt and realized I could move my body again. As I clawed at the ground in an attempt to crawl away back into the light of my room, I could hear him walking towards me, his pace quickening. I reached and took hold of a nearby branch to defend myself with. As my fingers wrapped around that slippery surface, I pulled it close, only to scream in horror. In my hands, I held what was left of a femur. The chunks of rotten flesh and dead skin where I gripped it tight coated my hands as the maggots exploded outwards and crawled up my arms. I dropped the thing, but before I could react any further, I felt the man grab me by my feet and drag me onwards. Chunks of bone and flesh swam around me, and as we went, I felt myself grow sticky with the blood that oozed out as I collided with that putrid debris. I tried to scream, but whenever I opened my mouth, chunky metallic tasting fluid pushed itself down my mouth and blocked my throat. I coughed, gasping for air, as I tried to spit the gore out and felt myself get thrown into the air. It was as if I was inside a cone. Onward stretched on a warm red light, the floor seemed to curve in a complete circle and defy gravity for these creatures. All around us were more of these things, some dragging their own captives deeper into the light 
and some deciding they'd rather feast on the less fortunate wherever they stood. The screams and groan laughter echoed on endlessly. That's about all I could take in before I collided with the ground, my skull slamming against the bile-covered floor in a whiplash. My heart was a piston threatening to burst out of my ribcage at any second. I felt the man yank me to my feet by my arm. I smelt the burning flesh before I saw it. I recognized them immediately. Inside that fiery hole was a mix of strangers and friends from the hospital. Here, I was reunited with a long dead patient I had shared rooms with. The departed hung stone-faced as they dangled on hooks, needles weaving in and out of their skin like maggots. I saw old doctors of mine begging with outstretched arms to those who hung above them as they burned and writhed in agony. I couldn't take it anymore. I begged for him to let me go, to take me home and let me see my parents. He cackled as he pulled me close to his face. I realized now that his skin was a sickly gray, his body emaciated with two large oozing holes in the middle of his chest. I could see the veins in his arms twist and connect along his wasted body like tubes. I stared deep into those black sockets as I fought for him to let me go. But my dear, he grinned, I thought this was what you wanted. He let me go and motioned to the suffering before us. Here, where you're not a burden, where the ones that failed you and pumped you full of hollow promises meet their retribution. Here, where you're free from the pain of sickness, a place in all your dreaming of your own creation. I stood in disbelief, tears welling in my eyes. How dare you? I croaked shakily. I would never, ever dream of this. Why in the hell would I ever make a place so awful? Why would I let such horrible hurt and torture ever happen? Tears had begun to well at the brink of my eyes as he stared at me. For the first time, I saw his smile disappear. He stood silently for a moment as his face drifted in thought. Nightmares, he began, are dreams too, child. Where do you think you went as your frail body was forced to slumber while their blades cut you open and tubes slithered and made a nest of your organs? Their sickness is intangible, but its casualties are not. As you witnessed your friends leaving bags, did the bitterness and betrayal in their last moments as they were abandoned to die ever escape you? What do you believe became of all the resentment and anger you felt as those lab coats, in all their knowledge, filled your veins with false hope, only for them to slowly give up on you? In all your time awake, you drowned in anguish at the thought you were torturing the ones you loved most simply by existing. Is it that far-fetched that in a world shaped by your experiences at the invisible hands of fate, your true feelings would create a world that reflected your deepest desires? Tears fell from my eyes as I stared at him. My knees trembled as they gave in, and I sank to that cold floor. If what he said was true, there was only one thing I could think to ask. With quivering lips, I shakily asked, Am I in hell? I watched as he kneeled down to face me. The screams of pain fell to a hush as all the eyes in the room fell upon us. Only the sound of the crackling fire filled the air. No such thing, child, he whispered, slowly pointing a withered finger between my eyes. The only world that exists is the world you birthed in here. As I felt that familiar pull take me back, he was the last thing I saw. As my eyes fluttered open and adjusted to those bright hospital lights, I felt my lungs expand once more. I had come to learn that my mother had walked in on the tail end of things. She had screamed when she saw my eyes bulged and roll into the back of my head, waking up my father and causing him to rush in. If he hadn't picked me up and driven me like a bat out of hell to the hospital, I wouldn't have made it. The nurses had dropped me onto the table and struggled to stabilize me and start my heart again. I was unresponsive 
and the general consensus from the doctors was that I was brain dead in a coma. My parents had just finished screaming their heads off when I finally woke up. As they took me in their warm arms, they sobbed, blubbering about how they thought I had died. The doctors had called it a miracle. As any good hospital would, they nursed me back to health and examined me physically and mentally to see if any damage had occurred to me as I was transported and resuscitated. I had passed all the mental assessments and everything seemed normal. Everything, except for the marks on my arm. As the lab coats struggled to figure out where they could have come from, my blood froze. There, right where he had held me as he dragged my body into the darkness, stood the deep claw marks where he had drawn blood.